anyone that wasn't here today. So we are writing up notes in a professionally formatted email like so with a salutation, a line break, and then uh, the body of the, the text, and then you'll end it. Uh, I always just do cheers uh, and then, you know, Mr. A. But you can write, cheers is fine. You can write sincerely, add that E. So sincerely, uh, or the some, some people write yours. I find that uncomfortable uh, because it is a little too affectionate. Um, yours in service, yours in scholarship. Those are all very professional. That's, that's quality. Your student is great also, but you can never go wrong with this sincerely. Uh, okay, so that's how you form a professional email. Uh, always remember to try to keep that uh, classy. The thing in a reply, you don't need to do that. After you have a back and forth going with me or anyone else, you don't need to necessarily always include that. You can get right to business. It turns into a instant message conversation after that. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is write up why the internet is a basic human right. Can someone explain that to me? Why is the internet basic human right? Maddie, what do you got? Yeah, it's your story. It, it's a story about you, about your people. I mean, even though, even though it might not feel like it, it's still a representation of, of our species and you're part of it. Um, and so it, it's, it's a product of our brain, of our intelligence. And so anyway, uh, so why was it created? The simple answer is uh, nukes. We were afraid of Russia nuking us. We knew that in the event, this we're talking the 1950s, 1960s, uh, World War II just uh, ended. Russia, our ally in World War II, was now turning into a Soviet nightmare, and uh, they had atomic uh, bombs. They had plans to bomb the U.S. in the event of a war. We knew that Russia would target our phone lines, would our communication systems. Russia, in the event of a nuclear war, would start first by attacking uh, American communication systems. And so the Army Research Project, or ARPA, A-R-P-A, uh, say A-R-P-A, Army Research Project, uh, I don't know, or I don't know all the acronyms. It's something like Army Research Project. Um, I don't know what that last name is. Uh, but ARPA, was asked, because now they're DARPA, they changed their names. Uh, but ARPA was challenged to say, all right, we need you to kindly build a system, a redundant phone system, so that if nukes start hitting our cities, I could be uh, have a phone conversation across the country, coordinating a military response to a Russian ground assault, and we would still, we wouldn't have interruptions. So instead of a phone line, we needed a phone web. Oh, okay. So um, we needed multiple lines of communication. So if one line got snipped by a bomb going off, our conversation would reroute. Would reroute. And so that was the challenge. And so they worked on a system. They didn't really work on it. They worked with contracts to research universities like UCLA, and others, including Case. Case was one of the first schools on the original ARPA net. So these schools, MIT and others, were the first organizations to get on the uh, original prototype internet, which used this thing called TCPIP. It's telecommunications protocol. It's just a system of rules a computer follows in transferring information from one to another. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more but they pr invented this prototype internet. And then they didn't know what to do with it. They invented it and they realized we've got to uh, figure out uh, what to do with it. And, and then the craziest thing happened. They went to AT&T 
the guys that invented this, they said, okay, we, we made this thing, uh, but it involves a lot of computers. They wanted to popularize it somehow. And they offered, they offered to sell it to AT&T, which was then known as Bell, Bell Labs. And they said, do you guys want this tech? And they passed on it. Bell, Bell was offered to own the entire internet. AT&T would have owned the internet. And they said, no, thanks. What does anyone want that for? And so, because no one was using it, it was just rough technology. No one could imagine what it would turn into, but they took a pass on it. Okay. And then in the 2000 election, I was around for this. Some of you probably weren't a lot. Was any, no, any, oh boy, none of you were alive. Were any of you alive in 2000? No. Oh my goodness. All right, well, Mr. A is coming to grips with the looming specter of death. Okay, but no problem. Uh, in the 2000 presidential election, um, Al Gore was up against who? George w. Al Gore was up against who? George W. 2000 election. George W. Oh, Bush. Oh, snap. Mr. A? Yeah. George W. Bush. Thank you. Bush. Yeah, Bush. Well, you knew it's 2000. It's the president before Obama. And you know, Gordon wins. So obviously, hopefully could have uh, figured that out. But Al Gore, uh, who was Bill Clinton's vice president, was now trying to run for to become president against George W. Bush, uh, against W. And he lost. And he was made fun of during the campaign. He was ripped on constantly for having claimed he invented the internet. It turned into a meme. Before we had the term meme, it was a meme. And people ripped on him for saying that he invented the internet. And so here's, here's a video about that, him finally answering that. Did you actually invent the internet? Uh, so quick video, and let me uh, so change this to optimize the video clip. And so now let's take a quick peek. During my service in the United States uh, Congress, uh, I took the initiative in creating the internet. So that one misquote hung around him. We still need highways and water lines, but we also need communications lines that can allow us to take advantage of the high performance computers. I had the exciting opportunity to get to know uh, some of the scientists and engineers that were working on it uh, back then. And, they shared with me uh, their expectations that it could very well grow into a, a much bigger thing than it was back in those days. Under the leadership of Vice President Gore, we've used information technology to bring government closer to citizens in many ways. What we call the internet today really began in the Defense Department uh, and in the early 1960s. Uh, Scientists and engineers sent the first digital messages from one computer to another. Uh, and then there were changes in laws that enabled that to, to spread more widely. And of course now it's a, a full-blown global phenomena that's uh, absolutely changing the world. So he, he very humbly stated that then a bunch of laws came to that made it easier for everyone to use. So after Bell tried to sell, I mean, after ARPA try, offered to sell the, the internet to Bell um, and Bell refused, the, uh, the Congress took up the initiative to say, oh my gosh, we, this, is, this is good tech. We need to get this out to the people. So what Al Gore did, and this is good stuff for your notes, is that Al Gore uh, pushed some laws that made the technology that uh, powers the internet, made it free for everyone, made it open sort of what's called public domain. So TCP IP was turned free. Uh, Al Gore did not do that himself, but he did help. He was a part of an initiative of other legislators that were pushing that and also helped uh, fund 
communication systems in the rural areas, making sure every lib public library had free internet access, stuff like that. So public libraries, he helped wire up to the internet and also um, helped make the technology that powers the internet, TCP IP, open source. So even though the military owned the tech, Al Gore and others changed it to a free public domain uh, piece of technology. Get that? No, it was a lot. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a popular thing. It was it was uh, um, bipartisan. So it wasn't it wasn't Republican versus Democrat. It was uh, like, hey, we got a new tech. Let's do it. So it was back in that day. It, it wasn't too hard left and right. I mean, it was ugly, but it wasn't anything like we've got right now. So it was very uh nonpartisan so pretty exciting stuff um yeah i mean yeah everyone wanted to it's like supporting the troops like everyone wants to be a part of that uh so so it was a big rush to to but what they did not like is they did not like him taking credit for it and that's why they flayed him uh and ripped him so hard on that 2000 uh campaign because you don't get to take credit for it he and i don't think he was trying to but uh he got tagged for it. All right, now we're gonna watch another video. And I wanna see, can you figure out why this video is funny? Um, yeah, hey, Drew, do you wanna, why don't you take a quick run to the bathroom? Imagine yeah. a world where every word ever written, every picture ever painted, and every film ever shot could be viewed instantly it's not her hair. Her hair is not the reason why this is hilarious, but her hair is awesome. It's so 90s. It's like late 80s, early 90s. It's great. It's great. No one does that anymore. At least I don't think. I don't know anything about fashion, but I'm, I don't see that around anymore. So In your home via an information superhighway, a high capacity digital communications network. What that would mean is you could transform your home into a mammoth interactive entertainment centre with the odd stock exchange and shopping centre thrown in. It sounds pretty grand, but it all comes down to computers communicating. And in fact, that's already happening on something called the internet that anyone in the world with a computer and a modem to connect it to a telephone line can subscribe to. There are over 20 million people connected up and one person Anyone already have an idea? Why is this hilarious? Right. First of all, her verbiage, it's, it's assuming that the computer isn't already connected to the internet. She had no idea about passive connectivity, that your phone is just always on the internet, that you would have to dial into it. She can't even assume that connection is already persistent. She's she has to say, oh, you're, you have to dial into a service. I had to call AOL at this time. So I was online in 1994, but I had to actually take off a headphone, I mean, a, a phone that was on at my house, and I put it on top of my computer. My computer actually had a speaker and a receiver that my phone sat on top of, and it would beep into my phone in order to connect to another computer. It actually used the phone. I mean, I quickly upgraded, but that was the first thing. It actually talked over the phone, literally made beeps over the phone. Um, so, and that's what you're hearing in the background. That dee -dee -dee -dee, that's what that sound like. And many a time, my mom would pick up the phone, and as soon as she would pick it up, she'd hear like she'd hear the computer trying to reconnect because someone had picked up the phone, and I would be kicked offline. So I'd be shouting, "Mom!" Uh, like because I needed that phone line. Eventually, I was able to get additional phone lines uh, in my house. So I did. I had a separate phone line just for my computer. Um, so uh, okay. Uh, but do you also notice the background? You see, in particular, screen? I know is connected. Is the American president? Any idea why that those all these computers are flickering? Why are, why Bill are all Clinton? I know that because I used this computer to write to him today and I've already got a reply from the White House. But and here it is, right? There it is. Thank you for writing. Yeah. 
Uh, is why they're flickering have to do with like the refresh rate and the camera FPS? Exactly. There's a, what's called a beat frequency. There is a difference between when this camera is taking pictures probably 20 or 30 times a second and that computer screen is refreshing probably 20 or 30 times a second. If they're not in sync, we're seeing, we're getting a picture of the old school uh, screen refreshing. And you can see it's refreshing in lines. That's called progressive. So, uh, I mean, interlaced. Uh, so the, they're interlaced. That's why we say 1080p, because we want progressive. We don't want 1080i. 1080i would be stupid high def uh, that no one uses anymore. It's about like doing an entire line at a time of colors rather than trying to uh, do one pixel at a time. Now we have LED screens or plasmas. Well, plasma is fading out, but now we have much different uh, technology than this. Those blocky CRTs. Writing to President Clinton via electronic mail, the president is committed to integrating this dynamic medium into the White House. And it goes on to give some details of his government's policy to encourage the building of information superhighways. <sighs> OK. The last bit that I just want, and I'll ditch this, uh, and I want to make sure you got something for your notes, is that, is that she is painting a picture. She's trying to get you to imagine something that no one believed. No one at the time thought that was, this was actually going to happen. And now you guys are bored to tears hearing about it because you take it for granted. Of course, you can find every human answer in history in, you know, in your pocket. Of course, you can shop online. Of course, you can buy stocks. You can start companies. You can create a revolution uh, using Twitter. Of course, you can do all of these things. We know this. But back then, they couldn't even believe it, that it was possible. They, they tell these stories, oh, could you imagine? Uh, about this information superhighway, it's so ridiculous uh, that they thought it was so absurd and that today you are taking it for granted. It's, it's nonsense, it's nonsense. Well, I mean, so one of the things that I hope you get an appreciation for is if I ask what does TCPIP stand for, that you guys have a quicker uh, reflex to press like command T or control T. And then what does TCP IP stand for? And then just being able to, uh, wow, I thought it was telecommunications protocol. Huh, I had the acronym down wrong. That's funny. Anyway, uh, irony. Uh, so the, uh, but, not taking it quite for granted, look, being able to quickly look something up. If I wanted to know like who won the 2000 election, just being able to quickly identify uh, like who it was and, and, and who won um, is important. And so uh, you have something in your pockets with your phone and in front of you on your computer that's very special. You should make sure you take advantage of it uh, and, uh, and appreciate it. All right. So hopefully that, uh, that it's home a little bit better. Um, all right. I have one last video for you, uh, and then we're done. Um, and then I'm going to do a little bit of cold calling, see what you guys remember. Uh, this guy, um, is, So this is the last video, and this is a TED Talk. I'll skip through a lot of it because it's um, I'm trying to think of the right word for this guy. I mean, what is? I mean, do you guys know what air? What does arrogant mean? Stuck up. Yeah. Um, this guy is is so frustrating to me. I don't know all of his little mannerisms all of the things he does with his hands, like his mouth noises. 
<laughs> it drives me crazy. Oh, this guy. Uh, but he makes a couple good points. So even though he's a little bit pompous, um, pretentious, that's the word I'm looking for, pretentious. It's like, it's not arrogant, it's not pompous, it's like right in between. It's like he's both, he, he clearly loves himself and it really thinks what he's got to say is super awesome. At the same time, he's kind of right. And so he gets away with it a little bit and he does it in a really sort of frustrating manner. That's, that's, that's the right word. Um, anyway, so let's take a look at what this guy has to say. What is the internet? I've always written primarily about architecture, oh, about yeah. buildings, uh, okay. and writing about architecture is based on certain assumptions. An architect designs a building and it becomes a place, or many architects design many buildings and it becomes a city. And regardless of this complicated mix of forces of politics and culture and economics that shapes these places, at the end of the day, you can go and you can visit them. You can walk around them, you can smell them, you can get a feel for them, you can experience their sense of place. And especially since about 2007, me was how quickly my relationship to the physical world had changed. In this very short period of time, you know, whether you call it the last 15 years or so of being online, or the last you know, four or five years of being online all the time, our relationship to our surroundings had changed and that our attention is constantly divided. You know, we're both looking inside the screens and we're looking out in the world around us. And what was even more striking to me, and what I really got hung up on, was that the world inside the screen seemed to have no physical reality of its own. If you went and looked for images of the internet, this was all that you found, this famous image by Opti of the internet as the kind of Milky Way, this infinite expanse where we don't seem to be anywhere on it, we can never seem to grasp it in its totality. It's always reminded me of the Apollo image uh, of the Earth, the blue marble picture, and is similarly meant to suggest, I think, that we can't really understand it as a whole. We're always sort of small in the face of its expanse. Yada, yada, yada. So if there was this world in the screen and if there was the physical world around me, I couldn't ever get them together in the same place. And then this happened. Here we go. My internet broke one day, as it occasionally does, and the cable guy came to fix it, and he started with the dusty clump of cables behind the couch, and he followed it to the front of my building, and into the basement, and out to the backyard, and there was this big jumble of cables against the wall. And then he saw a squirrel running along the wire, and he said, there's your problem. A squirrel is chewing on your internet. <laughs> and this seemed astounding. The internet is a transcendent idea. It's a set of protocols that has changed everything from shopping to dating to revolutions. It was unequivocally not something a squirrel could chew on. <laughs> but that, in fact, seemed to be the case. A squirrel had, in fact, chewed on my internet. And then I got this image in my head of what would happen if you yanked the wire from the wall, if you started to follow it. Where would it go? Was the internet actually a place that you could visit? Could I go there? Who would I meet? You know, was there something actually out there? And the answer, by all accounts, was no. This was the internet, this black box with a red light on it, as represented in the sitcom The IT Crowd. Normally, it lives on the top of Big Ben, because that's where you get the TV best reception. But they had negotiated that their colleague could borrow it for the afternoon to use in an office presentation. The elders of the internet were willing to part with it for a short while. And she looks at it and she says, this is the internet? The whole internet? Is it heavy? She's, they say, of course not. The internet doesn't weigh anything. And I was embarrassed. I was looking for this thing that only fools seem to look for. The internet was that amorphous blob, or it was a silly black box with a blinking red light on it. It wasn't a real world out there. But in fact, it is. There is a real world of the internet out there, and that's what I spent about two years visiting, these places of the internet. I visited large data centers that use as much power as the cities in which they sit, and I visited places like this, 60 Hudson Street in New York, which is one of the Hudson buildings... 60 Hudson Street is still there. It's still a huge building of networks. It's got one of the most advanced security. It's right in the middle, you know, it's in the middle of New York. But yet the security system is wildly intense. I've, I've heard that you can walk anywhere in, within this block and someone inside that building knows who you are and is pulling up your information. 
that they do passive surveillance on anyone in the general area. That's how, that's how important this building is. This is one of the, the, the core hubs of the entire internet. Things in the world, one of, of a very short list of buildings, but a dozen buildings, where more networks of the internet connect to each other than anywhere else. And that connection is an unequivocally physical process. It's about the router of one network, of Facebook or Google or BT or Comcast or Time Warner or whatever it is, connecting with usually a yellow fiber optic cable up into the ceiling down to the router of another network. And that's unequivocally physical. And it's surprisingly intimate. These build, a building like 60 Hudson and the dozen or so others has 10 times more networks connecting within it than the sort of next tier of buildings. So there's a very short list of these places. And 60 Hudson in particular is interesting because it's home to about a half dozen very important networks, which are the networks that serve the undersea cables that travel underneath the ocean, that connect Europe and America and connect all of us. And it's those cables in particular that I want to focus on. If the internet is a global phenomenon, if we live in a global village, it's because there are cables underneath the ocean, cables like this. And in this dimension, they are incredibly small. You can hold them in your hand. They're like a garden hose. But in the other dimension, they are incredibly expansive, as expansive as you can imagine. Uh, they stretch across the ocean. They're so that line runs across the ocean many, 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 many times. So that's running, those cables are crisscrossing all of our oceans. Three or five or 8,000 miles in length. And if the material science and the computational technology is incredibly complicated, the basic physical process is shockingly simple. Light goes in on one end of the ocean and comes out on the other. And it usually comes from a building called a landing station that's often tucked away inconspicuously in a little seaside neighborhood. And there are amplifiers that sit in the ocean floor that look kind of like bluefin tuna. And every 50 miles, they amplify the signal. And this is the rate of transmission is incredibly fast. The basic unit is a 10 gigabit per second wavelength of light, maybe 1,000 times your home connection or capable of carrying 10,000 video streams. But not only that, but you'll put not just one wavelength of light through one of, one of the fibers, but you'll put maybe 50 or 60 or 70 different wavelengths or colors of light through a single fiber. And then you'll have maybe eight fibers in a cable, four going in each direction. And they're tiny. They're the thickness of a hair. And then they connect to the continent somewhere. They connect in a manhole like this. Literally, this is where the 5,000-mile cable plugs in. This is in Halifax, a cable that stretches from Halifax to Ireland. And the landscape is changing. Uh, three years ago, when I started thinking about this, there was one cable down the western coast of Africa represented in this map by Steve Song as that thin black line. Uh, now there are six cables and more coming, three down each coast. Because once a country gets plugged in by one cable, they realize that it's not enough. If they're going to build an industry around it, they need to know that their connection isn't tenuous but permanent. Because if a cable breaks, you have to send a ship out into the water, throw a grappling hook over the side, pick it up, find the other end, and then fuse the two ends back together and then dump it over. There's an intensely, intensely physical process. So this is my friend Simon Cooper, uh, who until very recently uh, worked for Tata Communications, the communications wing of Tata, the big Indian industrial conglomerate. And um, I've never met him. We've only communicated via this telepresence system, uh, which always makes me think of him as the man inside the internet. <laughs> and he is English. The undersea cable industry is dominated by Englishmen. And they all seem to be 42. <laughs> because they all, they all started at the same time with the, with the boom about 20 years ago. And Tata had gotten its start uh, as a communications business when they, when they bought two cables, one across the Atlantic and the, one across the Pacific, and proceeded to add pieces onto them until they had built a belt around the world, which means they will send your bits to the east or the west. They have, this is literally a beam of light around the world. And if a cable breaks in the Pacific, it'll send it around the other direction. And then having done that, they started to look for places to wire next. They looked for the unwired places, and that's meant north and south, primarily these cables to Africa. But what amazes me is Simon's incredible geographic imagination. He thinks about this, the world with this incredible expansiveness. And I was particularly interested because I wanted to see one of these cables being built. So, you know, all the time online, we experience these fleeting moments of connection, these sort of brief adjacencies, a, a tweet or a Facebook post or an email. And it seemed like there was a physical corollary to that. It seemed like there was a moment when the continent was being plugged in, and I wanted to see that. 
And Simon was working on a new cable, WAX, the West Africa cable system that stretched from Lisbon down the west coast of Africa to Cote d'Ivoire, to Ghana, to Nigeria, to Cameroon. And he said it was coming soon, depending on the weather, but he'd let me know when. And so with about four days' notice, he said to go to this beach south of Lisbon, and a little after nine, this guy will walk out of the water. <laughs> and he'll be carrying a green nylon line, a lightweight line called a messenger line. And that was the first link between sea and land, this link that would then be leveraged into this 9,000-mile path of light. Then a bulldozer began to pull the cable in from this specialized cable landing ship, and it was floated on these buoys until it was in the right place. Uh, and you can see the English engineers looking on. And then once it was in the right place, he got back in the water holding a big knife, and he cut each buoy off, and the buoy popped up into the air, and the cable dropped to the seafloor. And he did that all the way out to the ship. And when he got there, they gave him a glass of juice and a cookie, and then he jumped back in, and he swam back to shore, and then he lit a cigarette. And then once that cable was on shore, they began to prepare to connect it to the other side, to, to the cable that had been brought down from the landing station. And first they got it with a hacksaw, and then they start sort of shaving away at this plastic interior with a, like, sort of working like chefs. And then finally they're working like jewelers to get these hair-thin fibers to line up with the cable that had come down. And with this hole punch machine, they fuse it together. And when you see these guys going at this cable with a hacksaw, you stop thinking about the internet as a cloud. It starts to seem like an incredibly physical thing. And what surprised me as well was that as much as this is based on the most sophisticated technology, as much as this is an incredibly new thing, the physical process itself has been around for a long time. And the culture is the same. You see the local laborers, you see the English engineer giving directions in the background. And more importantly, the places are the same. These cables still connect these classic port cities, places like Lisbon, Mombasa, Mumbai, Singapore, New York. And then the process on shore takes around three or four days. And then when it's done, they put the manhole cover back on top, and they push the sand over that, and we all forget about it. <laughs> and it seems to me that we talk a lot about the cloud, but every time we put something to the, on the cloud, we give up some responsibility for it. We, we are less connected to it. We let other people worry about it. And that doesn't seem right. There's a, there's a great Neil Stevenson line where he says that wired people should know something about wires. And we should know, I think, we should know where our internet comes from. And we should know what it is that physically, physically connects us all. So, thank you. <laughs> okay. What did you guys get for your notes from that? Is the internet a physical thing? Or is it just what I see on the other end of my screen? My computer is physical, but the internet is just an idea. True or false? This guy says false. This guy says no. You can, you can watch that guy jump out of the water and draw a line together. You can watch them work on it and, and hack it together and connect it. That there are building, you know, that it's not just some little magical box, that there are buildings like 60 Hudson and others that are indelibly physical. I mean, indelibly is just a pompous way of saying, you, no way you cut it, it's got to be physical. Uh, that, that there are businesses around connecting these together. So, yeah. The internet is, in some ways, this, uh, this weird globby picture here, uh, that it is just an idea of lots of people and things getting connected. But if you shake it, if you, if you look a little closer, you'll find that it, it always comes back down to something physical. Like, what's, what prompted this guy's story? Uh, oh, wait, hold on. Um, I want to... Uh, do, 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 do. Random number generator uh, two, four, eight, uh, ten. Um, one, two, ten. Okay, so uh, Teddy and Jack are one and two. Then we got three with Tommy, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. 
back here with Maddie. All right, so I'm just going to be asking questions, random number uh, 110 uh, here. Let's see if I can find a good random number generator.org. I don't know if this is, is good, but all right. So my first question that I'm going to randomly call on someone, uh, this is called cold calling. It's a teacher tactic that makes everyone pay more attention because you never know if it's your turn. And yet it's a fair system, so it doesn't trigger kids inherent ability to get grumpy at these kinds of things. Um, okay, so uh, first question is what triggered Andrew Bloom, this guy, what triggered Andrew Bloom's interest in investigating the in uh, internet? What was the inciting event that had him um, investigating uh, where the physical part of the internet goes. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Okay, number eight. Uh, so that's 10, nine, eight. Yes, I know. A squirrel chewed on the uh, cable into his house. That's right. So it was a physical failure that prompted him to investigate it. Now, uh, what was one thing you learned from this uh, from this presentation? Let's see here. Five, one, two, three, four, five. What do you, what do you something you learned from the video? Have you ever thought about the underwater connections of the internet before? Have you ever? Okay. I'll be good. So, I mean, that's that's a win for this class, getting you guys to think about something that we're taking for granted. Do you know what is replacing? There are several companies working really, really hard to replace the underwater internet with what? What's replacing the, for, uh, in the moment? Uh, yeah. So the big one is the Starlink satellite system. Um, so these are all rows of satellites that get ejected. And so there's going to be a huge web, a huge uh, web of satellites wrapping around the planet and giving free internet to the entire world. Um, so that's what they're working on. Let's see if I can get any uh, video of them um, releasing. Um, let's see. Our link, uh, it's our link, release. All right, well, if I had, I didn't know I was gonna be talking about this. There's a couple really cool videos of the satellites being released from the, the SpaceX uh, thing. Oh, is that it? Going on, good, yeah. Yeah, all right, so this is them in space. They can just see them from space, just this line of satellites that people are uh, getting into orbit. So this is going to replace the internet uh, under the sea, hopefully, and provide free, fast internet to the world. Um, so that's coming soon. That's pretty cool. Um, OK. Now, let's back up a little bit. Let's back up. Let's back up. Um, what prompted the creation of the internet? Uh, six, that is Andrew. And that, Andrew, hold on, hold on. We're practicing, practicing. We did this a lot. Hold on. Help me out. Carson. Ah, okay, Carson. Um, what prompted the creation of the internet? No problem. Carson gets a pass because I forgot his name. Number two, that's Jack Starr. Jack Starr, what prompted the creation of the internet? Uh, I don't think I have this one in my notes. No problem. That's another pass. But keep in mind, it's open internet. Should be uh, have your textbook open. All right, four, one, two, three, four. Tim. Yeah, we were afraid of nukes. Kind of hard to remember. Uh, kind of hard to forget. Giant nuclear bombs being, you know, threatened at the United States. So, uh, we, what in particular, yeah. 
these should already have been in your notes. And so we're sort of checking your notes. If you don't have any of this stuff in your notes as I'm going through it, I'm going to be doing this a lot. So you might as well make your life easier and jot them down. So yes, we were afraid of nukes. That prompted the creation of the internet. And so uh, what particularly, uh, let's build off of Tim's uh, absolutely correct answer. Why were nukes a problem? Why was the internet a response to nuclear war? How did you connect these two ideas? Please help them out. Uh, eight, uh, 10, nine, eight, uh, 10, nine, eight. Oh, and again. Okay. Why was the internet a response to the threat of nuclear war? How do you connect the two ideas? Say it again. What couldn't be disrupted? You got it. Communications. That's right. We knew that we knew the Russians' plans because we had the same plans. We were the first step in attacking another country is what? Knock out their communication. That's right. Take down their ability to coordinate a response to your invasion. That's why China right now is building a crazy number of attack satellites. What do you think they're doing with those attack satellites? If why do you think they want those attack satellites? Why is China building a, satel uh, a satellite that attacks other satellites? So whose internet can go down? Who's, other, who's the other country? Who would China be able to go again? Who, who else? Right, correct. Literally the entire rest of the world. In, in order to knock out an American re response to Chinese aggression, whether it be China attacking a neighbor or China attacking uh, United States, China would need to, in such a military event, take out communications. So that's why it's raising a lot of temperatures right now that China has released, has militarized space. That's one of the reasons why you saw stuff like Space Force and other uh, blatant attempts for America to also militarize space uh, more publicly. So um, it's, the same, it's the same conversation that we've been having with nukes and the internet. It's the same thing that keeps driving us forward. Okay. Uh, so when did this happen? When was the first internet roughly put together? Boop, 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 boop. Five, one, two, three, four, five. Drew, one, one more time. Uh, about when was the first internet created? Early 2000, oh, see. But when was the very first prototype of it? Internet actually got going uh, for real. Mm, not quite. Let's go one more. Number three, one, two, three. That is you, Tommy. 60s. 60s. Cold War. Think Cold War. Think, yeah, yeah. Rot, you know, think uh, USSR and all that. So the 60s is when ARPANET really got put together. And that, it wasn't called the Internet back then. It was called ARPANET. That was the very first thing, yeah, of course. Okay, so ARPANET, very first thing. All right, so did Al Gore create the internet? Uh, boop, 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 nine, that he literally just left, so we're gonna reroll. Uh, seven, and nine, eight, say, all right, hi. Uh, we did the internet, uh, sorry, uh, did Al Gore create the internet? No, he made the technology public. Correct. So that that's no Al Gore did not create the internet. He did help make the internet what it is today. So he helped further the technology to be fair, but no, he did not create the internet. That was a joke uh, from what presidential campaign? One, two, three, Tommy? Against George Bush in 2000, that's right. Um, Okay, uh, let's see here. Boop, 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 boop. 
Um, why did Mr. A make us watch this goofy video with this lady that has uh, big hair? Why did we watch the big hair lady? Ba -ba -ba -ba. Number one, that's Teddy. Teddy, why did we get the big hair lady? Um, because uh, it wa we wanted like to show like what the internet or like how it was uh, like at the beginning. Yeah, we want. I, like, I'm we wanted to, to see like you... people's perspective on it, like what how they saw it when it like first started. That's the key word I'm looking for: perspective. How much our impression of the internet has changed, going from something that we, too good to be true to something that is so life-changing. We can't even imagine a world without it. So we just take it for granted. And so, yeah. Um, but you know how it feels when the internet goes down. Like it's it's a weird feeling when the internet goes down, right? Like, or when you, you lost your phone and you don't have it. I mean, don't you, isn't it fair to say that human beings are cyborgs? Like, you know the idea, like the idea of Spiceboard. Right now, look, I just put something literally inside my head. I just put an AirPod in my ear and it beeps. And now it's going to read me my text messages. It's going to, you know, I can interact with my phone. And it's inside, technically it's inside my skull. Not only that, if I lose my phone, I get a physical reaction. I get tense, I get nervous. Sometimes I feel like my phone's vibrating in my pocket even though nothing's in my pocket. We have a chemical dependence on this little stupid rectangle that we drag around everywhere we go right now. We are connected to computers already. Uh, so according, if we explain this situation, how dependent we are to these little stupid rectangles we carry around with us all day long, then People would have called us, you know, uh, cyborgs a long time ago. So um, we are very much interconnected with this technology. And our perspective has most definitely changed. Okay, uh, just to recap, I want to talk to you a little bit about some a quick vocab change. We're not going to talk about it much, but in case some of you, there's every now and then one or two people in a class get really interested about the physicality of the internet. We're not talking about the physical stuff anymore after today, we're done. But for those of you that want to get interested, that are interested in this and might want to continue studying network technology, it's a very profitable, very interesting field. Not my cup of tea, but what you want to start studying is what's called the OSI model. TCP IP, the thing that really was the internet that started it all is just one layer. There's lots of other layers involved that that really make up the physical part of the internet. And so you should, if you're interested, you can continue to look at this. But my last bit that I want to explain is the the way the internet works to connect the physical to software is that it breaks up when you press send to send me your notes and get your credit for the day. When you press send, that email is actually going to get broken up into many different packets. And that's what they're called, packets. And that would be a great last pit, uh, point um, uh, that, not Carey, I think Drew Carey, not Drew Carey, it's a different television host. Carson, Carson, that's uh, what Carson's writing down right now is great. Uh, that packets, everything over the internet is broken up into small packets. And when you are playing a video game or when you're streaming, uh, whatever you guys like to stream, I don't know, what kind of shows are you watching now? Anyone have a favorite new show? Drew, what are you watching? Oh, that means it's embarrassing. That means he's watching like. That's cool. All right, I respect that. Uh, so as you're playing games online, uh, then um, Apex is better, I'm sorry. But is, as you're playing um, the, the precursor to Apex Legends, then what your internet traffic 
could be routed simultaneously. One move when you press reload might take a path that's different than when someone else is, is firing at you. You can be receiving packets of internet from, it, it changes a little bit, so, but you could be receiving packets from simultaneous places and our, our computers just assemble the packets and stitch them back together. When you send those emails to me, that system is going to go all the way to California, to Google, and then back again, uh, back to my computer, all under a second, and it's going to be, it's going to travel in many different shards and many different little packets. So that way, if any one of the cities between here and California blew up, it wouldn't be a problem because that packet would just reroute and reassemble on the other end. And if something happened that it got disrupted, then it would request for a resubmission. It's a redundant uh, packet-based system of the internet. And you can see that right there, that how that network is broken down into uh, packets. Um, so any letter is formed into digital letters that get sent over a, a very distributed network of, of computers and it bounces around until it gets to its location and then reassembled. Crazy cool stuff. That's what's happening on the physical part of the internet. Now you know what the internet is roughly and when it was created and why. Tomorrow we will look at what we do with the internet and this awesome guy who is really cool. Um, but uh, let's call it a day. Um, you guys did excellent. We will uh, review some of this stuff throughout their year. You will have multiple choice questions on this, but more importantly, you're going to have credit for hitting send right now and getting me that email. You now have two assignments completed already, which means all of you have A pluses in the class. So let's keep it that way. Have yourselves a lovely day. I need two minutes of you guys relaxing before I let you out so I don't uh, get angry emails that I'm letting students out early. Um, but, oh yeah, phone blowing up, all these internets coming in, all these internet notes coming in. That's great. All right, uh, Teddy and Jack, thank you guys for hanging out. I will see you guys tomorrow. Thank you.